<clears throat> so next up, uh, we have Dr. Stefan Kadaki and Rich Hanna from CHOP. Um, they're going to do a presentation on CAR T cell clinical trial analytics at CHOP. So moving from red cap to R shiny with red cap tidier. So saw that he's the co-host now. So if you're ready to start a little bit early, that'd be great. Not all good. All right. Um, I'm going to share my screen here. Let's see if that works. So uh, thanks. Uh, thanks uh, to the organizers for having me back here uh, at Our Medicine. I'm super excited to see uh, how things are coming together and uh, how um, how many people we're going to have we're, we have at this conference today. So um, I'm going to get started. Um, the title of my talk is CAR T cell. Trial Analytics at CHOP, uh, from REDCap to R Shiny with REDCap Tidier. And uh, I'm Stefan Kadaki. I'm an assistant professor of pathology and laboratory medicine at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, uh, also known as CHOP. And at CHOP, I wear a couple of different hats. I work with patients that have um, blood disorders like sickle cell disease and autoimmune disease. And I co-direct the Cell and Gene Therapy Laboratory. And this is a place where we manufacture cellular therapies for patients. You can almost think of it like a small pharmaceutical company that's built into the hospital. And then finally, I lead the cell and gene therapy informatics team. And Rich Hanna from our team is here is going to answer questions in the chat for you. Um, and uh, in the cell and gene therapy informatics team, we leverage tools like R, RedCap, and others to create data products that aid in our hospital's cell therapy operations. So here's the outline of my talk. Um, and uh, so we're going to cover a lot of ground, but it's because I feel that uh, you'll walk away with a much better picture of what it is that we're doing if I first tell you why and how we're doing the clinical trials we're doing and for which we want to streamline the analytics. So in part one, I'll shed light on why and how we conduct CAR T cell trials, focusing on uh, pediatric BLL, uh, be acute lymphoblastic leukemia. In the second part, we'll explore our quest for streamlining the CAR T clinical trial analytics at CHOP, the challenges we faced in building this pipeline, and how we're overcoming them with the help uh, of REDCap Tidier. B cell leukemia is the most common cancer in children. And although the prognosis is generally good, with cure rates after chemotherapy alone close to 90%, uh, and only uh, well, only one in three children who uh, relapse after that chemo initial chemotherapy treatment or that have leukemia that doesn't respond to the chemotherapy uh, will survive in the long in the long term. And historically, the approach in this case involved intensive chemotherapy followed by a stem cell transplant or a bone marrow transplant, same thing. However, at the advent of CAR T cell therapy a decade ago, has significantly changed the treatment landscape for these challenging cases. So let me introduce you to Emily Whitehead. In 2012, at just six years old, Emily came to CHOP with relapsed BLL that wasn't responding to chemotherapy. And she was so sick that a bone marrow transplant was off the table. Emily became the first pediatric patient to receive CAR T cells through a new clinical trial led by Steve Grupp. And this innovative treatment eradicated her cancer cells and they have not reappeared since. So fast forward to last year. In March of 2022, Emily celebrated a decade post CAR T treatment, marking her as the first patient to be cured by this revolutionary therapy. Though it's still early to determine overall cure rates for CAR T cells, we believe that a significant number of patients with relapsed or refractory BLL could potentially find a cure with just a single dose of CAR T cells. And, and this is nothing short of amazing. In, in oncology, it's incredibly uncommon to see a single treatment with a single therapeutic agent achieve such a remarkable outcome. Let's delve into the fascinating world of CAR T cells. Now, essentially, CAR T cell is a genetically modified T cell, which is shown here in blue. Can you guys see my, my cursor? Yes, I hope so. Um, um, and it's designed to produce a chimeric antigen receptor, or CAR, visualized here in purple. And this CAR enables it to identify, bind to, and kill a tumor cell, shown here in orange. 
And it does so because the car can recognize some target protein that's on the tumor cell. So the car is built of an extracellular component uh, derived from an antibody's antigen recognition domain and an intracellular part that consists of a signaling domain that can activate the T cell. An important aspect of CAR T cells is they are a living drug. They can divide and persist in the patient's body, and each CAR T cell can eliminate many tumor cells. So what makes a good target for BLL? CD19 is a compelling answer, and, and here's why. So, so what's CD19? CD19 is a protein expressed on all normal B cells throughout their development until they differentiate into the plasma cells that make antibodies. This is a function of the B cells make antibodies. So the um, uh, CD19 protein is restricted to B cells. You don't have any CD19 on other cell types. You don't have them on blood stem cells or other tissues. And fortunately, most B cell cancers remain the expression of CD19. So most B cell cancers such as BLL are CD19 positive. So the key point is that humans can survive without B cells, and that decreases the risk of CAR T cells attacking vital tissues. And our group and others have shown that CD19 targeted CAR T cells are safe. Uh, they achieve complete remission, uh, complete response in 70 to 90% of pediatric patients with relapsed and or refractory ALL, with some patients achieving durable mission, like Emily. However, like I mentioned earlier, we don't know the exact cure rate because we're only now reaching a decade since the first treatments. Uh, and outcomes from um, a large multicenter trial of CD19-directed CAR T-cell product, the same product that Emily received, led to the approval of Tisagen Leclucel, or Tisacel, uh, brand name Camraya, uh, by the FDA in the United States in 2017. Um, and that's the first FDA-approved CAR T therapy. So as of now, the FDA has approved six CAR T therapies, four of which, including TISA cell, target CD19, these, these first four here. Um, however, only TISA cell is currently approved for children. So this is what we, uh, this is the only drug that we administer, the only CAR T drug that we administer at CHOP here. However, we have a lot of clinical trials that we're conducting with experimental CAR T therapies for other conditions, including acute myeloid leukemia, Hodgkin and non-Hodgkin lymphoma, T acute lymphoblastic leukemia, neuroblastoma, and other solid tumors, with many others in sort of de development. Um, and successful implementation of these innovative therapies really critically heavily depends on effective data collection and analysis for clinical trials. And to illustrate this, I want to explore a CAR T cell trial that uh, that we launched less than a year ago. This trial is titled a phase 1-2-B trial of humanized CD19 CAR T cells manufactured using Prodigy for pediatric BALL. Let's break this down. Phase 1-2-B indicates that we're assessing both the safety, that's the phase 1 part, and efficacy, that's the phase 2 part of these CAR T cells. Humanized uh, refers to certain tweaks that were made to the CAR to try to enhance its function. As for manufactured using Prodigy, the Prodigy is a novel automated manufacturing platform that allows us to produce these clinical CAR T cells uh, in our own laboratory. And in our hands, this cuts down the cost of making these things by over 90%, over 90% compared to commercial CAR T products. And we believe that this cost reduction could potentially broaden access to this life-saving therapy both in the US and globally. So here's the study schema. We have two cohorts, um, patients who've previously received and failed CAR-T therapy and first-time CAR-T therapy recipients. And after consent and enrollment, um, T cells uh, are harvested from the patients by a process called apheresis. And following this, we manufacture the CAR T cells in our lab, and then patients undergo lymphodepleting chemotherapy. And this makes room for the incoming CAR T cells. And then they receive a single dose of humanized CD19 directed CAR T cells. We then evaluate the effectiveness of the treatment with a marrow biopsy and lumbar puncture on day 28 or around day 28, followed by a 12 uh, month follow up period 
uh, during which we see the patient on multiple visits. So after the 12 months, patients are then enrolled in a 15-year long-term follow-up study. And today, um, we have successfully man manufactured products for eight patients. We've infused six. Four out of four patients from which we have 20, 28 day data have responded. So this is working really well so far. So with that, let's move on to the second part, analytics for CAR T trials at CHOP, where we will look at how we've previously collected patient data from these trials and how we're trying to do it now or in the future. So um, as you might imagine, all of these trial visits that we just talked about, they generate a lot of data, and we used to capture all of this on paper. So each, um, each patient on a CAR -T, T trial, so each binder is not a trial, each binder here is a patient, and we've treated almost 500 patients in clinical trials so far. So what you're seeing here is just a small fraction, maybe 10% of the binders we have here at CHOP just for CAR T patients. So a vast effort goes into this data collection, but there isn't even a clear pathway to getting any value out of this. So, uh, so there's, there's trial monitors that look at these binders and then we go through them and, and collect data on spreadsheets then they'll then turn into uh, data, data, data and safety monitoring board reports. Um, researchers, uh, on the other hand, uh, researchers who would like to write papers often ignore these binders completely and instead choose to manually extract relevant data from the medical record directly. Uh, so, so as you, you can really imagine here that there's a lot of papers that were never written or were published or written and published much later than would have been possible because of these challenges. Um, and so our objective here was to overhaul this process by digitizing the entire CAR-T clinical trial data capture to analytics process by developing automated real-time analytics. And I think this will have many benefits. For example, we should be able to identify issues that require intervention earlier, and this might improve patient outcomes. We completely expect that this will streamline the generation of, of research abstracts and publications, uh, and that'll boost researchers' productivity by allowing for more and earlier publications from each trial. And uh, also a standardized and partially automated approach to data capture and analysis should reduce the labor required to initiate and conduct new clinical trials, leading to more and cheaper trials overall. So now let's discuss how we built the end-to-end -end trial analytics pipeline. The basic idea is that the data gets abstracted from our electronic health record, or EHR, and then goes into an electronic data capture EDC system that we're custom building using REDCap. Uh, then that data gets automatically pulled into a shiny dashboard that displays, uh, displays the relevant tables and graphs. Okay, let's move forward. All right. Oh no, it's all pixelated. Uh, anyways, okay. Um, so exploring the REDCap-based uh, electronic data capture further, and you just, you'll just have to believe me that this uh, is <laughs> a screenshot of a of a red cap, uh, our red cap data capture doesn't matter. So we chose red cap for uh, for a bunch of different reasons. Uh, we have it available here at CHOP. It's free to use for us, and it's secure for storing sensitive information. And uh, we have, importantly, we have complete control over data entry instrument configuration and data handling. So this database shown in this super blurry screenshot is longitudinal. Uh, and it allows us to, so this means that it allows us to document repeat measures such as repeated labs once for each visit. And there may be many, many visits for, uh, for each patient in a trial. In addition, we capture adverse events and adverse events don't really fit so neatly into this longitudinal paradigm, but REDCap lets us manage this using a repeated instrument setup. Uh, so what this arrow is going to point at is, so now you'll just have to believe me, that we've also incor incorporated uh, a clinical data pool, or CDP, and CDP is a relatively new red cap feature that automatically pulls data like demographics, vital signs, and labs from the EHR, and that saves considerable, considerable time and reduces data entry errors. Oh no, why does it keep? All right, I'm going to try to fix this. Oh no, it's all messed up. All right. Ugh. All right. Well, this is this is what the um, <laughs> this is what the with the shiny uh, based real time CAR T 
dashboard looks like if uh, you have really terrible vision. Um, so, so this is written in Shiny. Uh, we decided to use Shiny because obviously we love R and because uh, we can securely store sensitive information on our R Studio Connect instance that's behind our hospital firewall. Uh, and what Stephen, if you want, I could show, I, I have one prototype up now, if you would like me to share that. Um, yeah, yeah. Why don't we do that? I think we have, we have maybe two, two or three extra minutes because we start early. I really don't know why it's doing that. Let's see. Uh, can you see my screen? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Can you open the, uh, this is great. Can you open the, um, uh, the adverse event summary? It's further up. Right here. Okay, so so what you see here is the uh, DSMB or Data and Safety Monitoring Report View, uh, with an adverse event summary table that breaks things down uh, by phase, a phase of a trial, and whether the event was serious or not serious. Um, so um, so we we architected uh, uh, so this this is we architected the dashboard so that each analytic object like this table or any any graphs that are in here are independent units that can be unit tested. Um, we also uh, set up and this is really similar to uh, the the talk we just heard. We 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 uh, initially the, the 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 dashboard was really slow, and so the way we solved this is we set up a data entry trigger and caching mechanisms that make the data dashboard always up to date and lightning fast. So whenever now whenever somebody enters new data data into the Redcap database, the affected uh, table gets rebuilt and stored, and we we use pins for this on our R Studio Connect instance. And um, I think I can take over again. Thanks, Rich, for saving my life. Okay. Yeah, I'm not sure. Yeah. Oh, where are you, Zoom? It's a win, a win, win. Okay. Sorry, guys. Okay, can you see my screen again? Yes. Okay. So what I wanted to uh, say next is that we we really owe uh, a a great deal to the R community for uh, for building this. Uh, we use several packages, including BS4 dash, uh, GT summary, obviously Golem, uh, DT, and of course the Tidyverse suite. Uh, however, we we did encounter a significant hurdle early on, and and that's that the Redcap API output is far from user friendly when you deal with a complex project like the one one that's longitudinal or has repeating elements or both. And so we recognize the need for um, uh, for, for some functionality for a package that makes it easy to import comp uh, to import complex Redcap projects into R, and that led us to create one ourselves. And that's how Redcap Tidier was born, an open source package that we first launched a year ago, actually at R Medicine last year ago. So Redcap Tidier makes it easy to import any Redcap project into R, even the complex ones that contain longitudinal or repeated instruments or events. And it does so by integrating data and metadata into a single object. Uh, and we call that object the super tibble. Um, it's easy to explore that super tibble in the RStudio IDE and manipulate it using tidy semantics like the pipe operator. And we ensure that it's both robust and efficient so it can be used in a production environment. Uh, it's built on top of the Redcap R package, which itself is robust and efficient. Um, it fo we follow Tidyverse SDLC recommendations 
uh, we have pretty good test coverage, uh, and we have uh, and we have um, continuous integration uh, uh, enabled on GitHub. Uh, we also have extensive error checking with helpful helpful error messages. We think they're helpful. And uh, we have used Profvis uh, and other tools to profile and replace um, a slow tidyverse code with base R where we found bottlenecks. Um, so let's delve deeper into the red cap R, uh, red cap tidy R super table. Um, so this object gets generated when you read a red cap project using the read underscore red cap function. The read red cap function is really simple to use. Um, it takes it has two required arguments: the uh, uh, the URI of the of the of, of the red cap server and, and, and an access token. This is very similar to um, red capper, but it returns it, it returns this object here. So what you can see here is part of the super table from the Prodigy trial. Uh, uh, when you display it in the RStudio uh, IDE viewer. Each row of the super table corresponds to an instrument. So you can see the name and the label, the human readable name label of the instrument. And there's like a couple of additional columns here, but here's the really important ones. Um, and then you have two list columns. Uh, one is red cap data, one is red cap metadata. And each of these list columns contain uh, a set of tables, one for each instrument. So this this uh, this contains the, the data and the field level metadata from uh, that instrument. Um, and so so what you can do in the RStudio IDE, I can do it right here right now, but you can click on this table icon and you can drill down into the data. And this is a really, really easy way to do initial data exploration on a project wide level. So what else can you do with the super table? Uh, so we have two ways to extract data, uh, instruments data from, 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 from this. The first is bind tibbles. Uh, bind tibbles makes the data tibbles magically appear in your environment. Um, and uh, extract tibble uh, is another mechanism uh, where, where it track, extracts and uh, returns an individual data table that you specify. And both of these uh, functionalities uh, pair well with the pipe operator. You can uh, you can use make labeled to add variable labels. We love variable labels, so we use the labeled package to attach the red cap field labels, uh, which are used at the as the data entry prompts, and we use them to now turn them into descriptions, uh, variable labels of the of the data columns. Um, and finally, um, and this is hot off the press with the version 0.4 that we just published to CRAN, you can use write redcap XLSX to export to Excel. And this feature is uh, super handy for collaborating and it supports labels. So your collaborator can see descriptions of each variable. So here's what the Prodigy database uh, would look like uh, as an Excel sheet. Um, uh, so, you, uh, so you have a table of contents and then each instrument is in its own tab. Um, of that uh, uh, is in its own tab. All right, so um, so the latest version of RedCap Tidier 0.4 just came out of on CRAN a few days ago. Um, so you can install it by typing install packages, uh, RedCap Tidier, you get the latest and greatest. Please, please, please do test it out with your databases and let us know what works and importantly, what doesn't. Um, we are, uh, we're, we're very interested in getting feedback. We really wanna make this work for any any red cap database, no matter how how weird it is, um, and and do tell us about features that you'd like to see. Um, if you scan this QR code here, uh, you'll take you to the package down documentation site. You'll find a getting started tutorial and uh, a bunch of vignettes, including one that that tells you exactly how that red cap tidier super table works and exactly what kinds of transformations it makes to make the the, the data more user friendly. So let's recap. Uh, we talked about how BLL is the most common cancer in children, and a CAR T cell is a living drug that consists of genetically modified T cells that are capable of killing cancer cells. And CD19 directed CAR T therapy uh, has proven to be a groundbreaking treatment for relapsed or refractory BLL in children. And we used a trial that tests a new variation of a car that's humanized and a new manufacturing platform, the Prodigy, to establish an end to end analytics pipeline framework for CAR-T clinical trials. And uh, RedCap Tidier built to support this pipeline 
and makes it easy to import any REDCap project into R. And it's robust and it performs well, and you can export a collaborator-friendly version of the project to Excel. So now let's look very briefly consider the impacts and the benefits of this approach to date. Uh, building our own REDCap databases has dramatically increased the satisfaction of our data entry personnel. Um, we uh, created a database build standard, which enables us to use a templated approach to building new cl clinical trial or CAR-T trial EDCs. And this in turn has allowed us to build new databases for five additional trials in a small fraction of the time that it may, took us to build the first one. And then one key function of the dashboard is to automatically generate what's called a data and safety monitoring board or DSMB report, which is the, the, the view that you just saw. So these DSMB reports are created at regular intervals to play a vital role in clinical trials to ensure the safety of the patients in the trial. And they usually take a highly trained professional multiple weeks com to complete and, and our automation has reduced this to mere seconds. So I wanna thank uh, I want to thank everybody. I want to thank everybody on the CGT Informatics team. Thanks, Rich uh, uh, and, 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 and Ezra. Uh, thanks, Rich, for saving my life just now uh, by showing a view of the, of the Prodigy Reporter. Uh, I want to thank the clinical team and, uh, and our funders and everybody uh, uh, in the R Medicine Org Committee and everybody who came to uh, attend my talk. Uh, thanks very much, guys. Happy to take any questions. Awesome talk, Stefan. I think there, uh, Rich got most of the questions in the chat. There's one quick one that I saw about having to get your red cap instance. Um, let's see, where is that? If you download the slides from from uh, from Sketch, you're actually going to see the high resolution slides. <laughs> so, uh, anyways, that was also a question. Yeah. yeah. Uh, did you have to get your RedCap instance certified Part 11 compliant? So that's a, that's an excellent question, and we um uh, uh and our um our groups just just this okay. I'm, I'm going to take a quick step back because it's a super important question, and it's uh, very contentious. Uh, we as a group, uh, as the whole cell therapy program, have decided that Part 11 does not apply to us. And, and this is because, um, I, you know, the, when, because the, uh, uh, the FDA um, wants, uh, in the guidance, wants every center to make that own determination. And then there's, and then it's very, very vague about what it is, how to make that determination. One critical thing is that if you want to, if you do work that's in preparation of a marketing application for a, for a, for a pharmaceutical product, then you got to do it. Otherwise, you don't. And this is how we're taking it. So we're saying categorically, no, we're not doing part 11. Um, we're not going to tell anybody we're part 11 compliant. And this is this is this makes our lives much easier. However, um, we uh, we are bound by other standards. There's a there's a foundation for the accreditation of cellular therapy. Uh, so if we um, as, as, and they just also promulgated some new rules that we have to for 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 electronic records that we have to abide by and so so for some applications that we build we actually have to be fact compliant but not part 11 compliant so so it becomes complicated and, and uh, i mean the, the other thing is the question is like do you like how important is quality in your software and quality i think is very important we try to do a lot of unit testing and uh, and continuous integration that kind of stuff um but uh, but we want to we, we we always take sort of a risk based approach to things like if something cannot ever like really break if it could really harm a patient if something something doesn't work as it should then that gets validated and tested very rigorously if that isn't the case then then we don't bother or like you know for these databases we don't bother validating them uh, because they're not really gonna hurt a patient um, if if there's a data entry error in there but we still do our best to try to to try to make them make them work well. Yeah. Thanks for that question. I appreciate it. Awesome. Thanks. All right. We're going to move on to the next talk. Um, thanks a lot, Stefan. That was super interesting.